Thank you, gentlemen. Now we will skip to the final, the last question. And after that, you will have uh, five minutes to sum up the, the whole discussion. So the last question. Uh, this will be the question for Jaron Brook, and I want to ask you that why in the, this discussion you think that the force is the uh, the force is the need of the people, yeah? Uh, because when we are talking about the private force is what I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. The force is people need because when we are talking about the private agency, which should protect people, because force is not a need. The true need is to be protected for the force, yeah? So the agency will not create the war, to, uh, constant war, war with each other, yeah? They rather want to, uh, non, uh, to stop the wars, to stop the violence, because the, the, they, uh, people will pay them for that, yeah? So they work like, like a company. Not like a government. Government uh, have got uh, money uh, in any way, yeah? It, it's uh, good or bad government. Company can earn money, achieve money and people only when it's good on their own way. So, well, that's the question. There is a f Thanks for asking the question. It's a good question. The fun there's a fundamental difference between economic power and uh, enforce, or what I call political power. Uh, the difference is the one embodies a gun and the other one does not. Economic power is truly voluntary. Economic power is about the gaining of values and constant progress and constant competition and constant improvement in win-win transactions and win-win relationships. Once you have, once you bring in the gun, once you bring in force, protection you call it, but protection is very naive. It's, very, it's a very nice word, right? Because what is my protection might be force against you. I need to protect it against you. You, you. You're doing stuff economically that I don't like. I want your stuff. And my protection agency is now, I've paid it a lot of money to go after you and go after your stuff. And if my protection agency has a bigger gun than your protection agency, then who do you think is going to win that one? It's all about guns. It's all about the size of the weapons. It's all about force. It's not about value creation. It's about guns. It's about the bigger gun wins, right? So uh, political power, the power of the gun, is about coercion. It is about force. Whether it's held by the government, it's, it's power, it's the same kind of power in government, or it's held by private entities. Private entities that are supposedly motivated by money, but they still have a gun in their hand. And a gun in their hand allows them to inflict their power over other people without it being voluntary. And their whole purpose is not to be voluntary because they're protecting me. They're not protecting you. You didn't pay them. So they're there to protect me. So if I have a conflict with you, they represent me. And if they're going to inflict their power on you, they're not violating any voluntary agreement they had with me. I, I say, cool, go after him. Now you have a protected agency responsible for protecting you. And they have to negotiate, or they have to war, or they have to do whatever. And what if their negotiations break down? And this is why, you know, it was brought up that states functions like this. Yeah. And, and exactly what we get. We get wars. We get World War II. We get even stupider World War I, or both are equally stupid, I guess, World War I. We get, we get because there's no final authority. There's no way to arbitrate disputes. And they have big guns. And I can inflict, you know, I'm Germany, I can inflict my g bigger gun than on Poland, I'm going to take you over. Well, they, the, the protection agency is going to do exactly the same thing. And there's no way to stop them. And the will of the people doesn't matter, because the people, unless the people are all armed, and, and that's fine. I mean, the, the one solution I can imagine to all this is, we're all armed. We all carry, we all have the machine gun ready, and, uh, and we're all constantly, all the time at war. But nobody wants to live like that. Nobody wants to live like that. Nobody should want to live like that. Nobody should live like that. I, again, I consider the anarchist position on the same, in the same place as, as authoritarianism because I think it leads to the same state of mind, the same kind of life, which is a life of fear and oppression and, and constant, constant, uh, constant fear, constant inability to use the one weapon 
the one tool we have to produce, which is our mind. If I can jump in to this question also. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. The, one, so, the last two sentences. Uh, okay, all right. So first of all, I would say maybe, maybe that would be worth mentioning today, uh, something that we haven't mentioned yet. The difference between the operation between the states and as what you mentioned in your question, between private security agencies, which, by the way, I think we can expect would be actually insurance companies working on a free market. Insurance companies provide service uh, to people. They, they insure them against uh, catastrophes. These catastrophes can be natural catastrophes or social catastrophes. Social catastrophe is nothing else than being a victim of a crime, being a victim of a mugger, and, uh, uh, and, and therefore this, this, this kind of balance that you should suggested that your uh, your defense agency represents you against uh, against another person and uh, the only thing that the agency wants to do is basically to uh, respect your rights is also that doubtful because in the case of insurance companies these interests are not so easily distributed because the insurance company considers a person who actually is a victim of a catastrophe a winner against the insurance company so so the incentive structure wouldn't be so straightforward as you're suggesting. But then another, so th that's the one thing. And now we can compare these two models that we haven't yet. Uh, was the it was the ultimate was was the crucial difference between these two organizations? The crucial difference is that the state can externalize costs of its aggressive behavior on the taxpayers, on the people that involuntarily have to hand over the money to the state because they are threatened with death and, and, and loss of the, of the life, uh, liberty and property. Whereas organizations such as uh, security agencies, or, uh, in particular insurance companies operating on the free market, they operate on a different basis. They cannot externalize costs of their aggressive behavior on their customers because as you suggested, and as you suggested rightly, they are financed through a voluntary purchases of the service they provide to the customers, to the willing customers. And therefore, the, the incentive to start the war, to, war, to have a war between uh, agencies, is, uh, is a different sort of incentive, and I claim is a, is a smaller incentive than there is between the states. We can ask ourselves this question. Imagine two organizations. Ceteris paribus, all other things being equal, counterfactually, all other things being equal, organization A and organization B, they equal, uh, except one thing, organization A can't externalize costs of aggressive behavior on other people through taxation. Organization B can do that. And now ask yourself, which of these two organizations will be more aggressive? Where will be the bigger incentive to start violence, to initiate physical force against innocent people? So, uh, and my last point about, you know, arming to teeth, having guns next, you know, with you all the time, machine guns and things like that. Well, I, 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 I basically, as a free marketeer, I believe in the vision of labor. And I don't think that we would have to defend ourselves individually. I think we would outsource it. We could outsource it. We could have a division of labor and professional agencies specializing in this service would basically protect us. In particular, that would be insurance companies as they protect us now, before something happens to us, not afterwards as it's the case with the police. And actually that was also surprising for me when you mentioned that you're not uh, af af afraid of the state. Taking into consideration how many violations are committed by the police in the United States is really surprising. We at least in Poland don't have this problem because our police is really not so strong and doesn't have such, uh, doesn't have such powers. But uh, it's surprising to hear it from someone from the United States where you really have a big problem with the police and the violence of the police. Uh, so, so yeah, that would be, that would be it okay. on my part. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are running out of time. So uh, would you like to say the last few words to sum up today's meeting? Um, well, I'll just say, just to correct this, I, I, if I said I'm not afraid of the state, then I misspoke. Of course, I'm afraid of the state in its current, in its current uh, manifestation. Uh, of course, I'm afraid of the direction in which states are going, because they're only going in the direction of infringing on individual rights more so. Uh, what I'm not afraid is afraid of a state that protects individual rights. I'm not afraid of a state that is structured around and, uh, the principle the principle, which has to be well-defined and clearly defined, of, 
uh, individual rights and individual sovereignty. Um, I, I, where I am really afraid is of uh, the anarchist, uh, of the anarchist solution, the anarchist world, the the, the deliverance of anarchy. I, I think is I think it's scary. I think it's um, I, I think it's destructive, and I think that the that the arguments are, are, are inherently unsound and unreal, uh, and the the solutions to to the real issues are detached from all reality. Uh, if you want anarchy. Somalia is waiting for you. Uh, you can go back to the Middle Ages and live in the Middle Ages and, and, and enjoy that. That is anarchy. It's not a distortion of anarchy. It's anarchy. It's exactly what anarchy is. Uh, it, 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 it's not that it hasn't been tried. It's been tried many, many, many times. And it's, it's tried, as I said, in our inner cities among gangs. The, 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 you know, there is anarchy all over the world. You, you can go find a place and go live there. Um, it, it, it's a horrific existence. It is not an existence worthy of human beings. Uh, and I, I, I think it does us a disservice as defenders of liberty, of, of those of us who want to defend freedom, uh, to advocate for a system that is so destructive to human life. What is the difference between objective and non-objective law, and what are the consequences in society of each? Well, that is one of the most important questions today. An objective law is a law which defines objectively uh, what constitutes a crime or what is forbidden and the kind of penalties that a man would incur if he performs the forbidden action. Uh, objective means uh, definable, graspable by a rational consciousness. Therefore, an objective law would be a law which a man can understand and apply so that every man ahead of committing an action would be able to tell what uh, is the crime forbidden, what penalty would he incur if he uh, commits it, and can make a decision accordingly. To be a law-abiding citizen, he would, should be able to understand the law and apply it as guidance to his own social actions. Now, a non-objective law is one which cannot be defined. It means a law without specific definition, which may have as many different interpretations as there are men. Under a non-objective law, a citizen cannot tell what is for per permitted or forbidden. He cannot tell what uh, action is socially accepted, what action will be punished, and what will be the nature of the punishment. A non-objective law is left strictly at the interpretation of the authorities, usually the judges under dictatorships, it would be the commissars. But uh, in any case, a non-objective law is one which a man cannot interpret himself, a law that is not defined and is, is in fact undefinable. The best example of it is, of course, antitrust legislation, where a man cannot tell actually what is permitted to him, or what is forbidden, and may commit a, a legal crime without knowing that he's doing it. Mr. Ryan, a very popular legal doctrine holds that law is actually what the judges say it is, and that legislative enactments are only sources of the law which the judges use to derive what they believe the law is. Do you, do, you, do you believe this is a primary cause of the present state of non-objective law? Uh, it's not the primary cause, it's one of the manifestations. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Justice Holmes, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who originated that doctrine. He was the, the worst philosophical influence on American law. Uh, that is a statement of pure non-objectivity. This is the formula for tyranny, because if the laws are whichever the judges interpret, I don't see the purpose of having any laws at all. It would simply mean that whichever the judges or the authorities decide at any given moment uh, will determine what happens to the citizens of a country. It is not a formulation of law, it's the destruction, the negation of the concept of law.